Hey y'all, how's it going? I hope you're doing okay. I know it's been a while, but uh, <laughs> I've been busy with other things. I did get that job that I was applying for in my last video. It's a teaching job at a gallery, um, so I'm excited about that. But that's besides the point. I wanted to do a video today that's another kind of like book favorites collecting all the stuff that I've either recently gotten or have had for a while uh, that I just really enjoy. So these are going to be all like artist monographs, uh, which are just, you know, collections of an, a specific artist's work. Um, yeah, I'm excited to show you what I've been looking at and hopefully you can find somebody you've never heard of that you're really into. Let's get into it. Okay. So first off, there's this monograph by Lucas Samaras. I know about Lucas Samaras' work because I worked at the Albright Knox, which is an art museum in Buffalo, New York. Um, and he has a work there called, informally called, The Mirrored Room. Um, and it's essentially just like a, a box that has got a table and chairs that are all covered in mirrors. So when you go inside, there's this like, infinitely recursive effect. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Yayoi Kusama's mirrored infinity rooms, then it's a similar effect. They were kind of producing them at the same time in the 60s, uh, but Kusama has gone on to make many more. I think Samaras has made a lot of versions as well, but that's not the only thing he does. Um, so this is uh, kind of more photography-based work, and it's all in this format, which is really interesting to me. You usually don't find that with monographs. Um, the paper is really, really thick, which is pleasing. He kind of juxtaposes different photographs where the elements are slightly changed, so it's almost this narrative effect where you see the differences between the two and start to make connections uh, and wonder what the concept behind those exchanges are. I think this is a great uh, example of graphic design being used well in a monograph. Uh, its format being in this orientation rather than the typical orientation is a really interesting choice um, and the way the images are framed within the page I think is also a good choice. Here he's kind of like replicated the gallery a little bit. And I think there's something to be said about um, reusing the same motif in a different photograph or similar imagery in two different photographs because it's it kind of harkens back to the idea of the double which has become a, a kind of queer engagement with the image. I mean a lot of the themes within this work couldn't be further from the concepts that I work with but I think it's important to expose yourself to artists that are outside of your wheelhouse that are doing things much differently from you. Um, just because their work is different from yours doesn't mean that it's not valuable or interesting. This is my favorite part of this book. Uh, this is kind of a separate section from the photographs, but they are related. This is essentially like a long-form poem that he's written, where each line is a different word. It goes on from here until the end of the book. And it has a really interesting rhythm. Every day I make lists of must things, but I'm resigned for bust. Some other paint on some other unsuspecting thing. A couple strokes could turn abstraction into snug as slug realism of flowers, fruit, or faces. Cast away, handmade love. 
but keep a wide-eyed hope on its transitory vacillations of easy access to rapture or theft. I fill my will with such sweet wanteds until I get that suffocating stuffed inside my skin feeling. Anyway, <laughs> that's um, just a passage from this poem. I think if you actually put it in paragraph format rather than dividing it line by line here, um, it would probably end up not being too long, <laughs> but in this format it's super long. Um, but I really like the effect that dividing the poem into individual words has. It makes each word so much more important than it might seem in the context of a sentence. And it also kind of makes the rhythm of reading the poem really stilted. But anyway, um, that's my... I accidentally stole this from my old friend and landlord. Um, who now is living in Vermont and I'm living in Alabama. Obviously we met in Buffalo and knew each other there. Um, I, yeah, I accidentally stole this from him, so Matthew, if you're watching this, I'm sorry and I'll mail this to you. <laughs> okay, next book. Next off is this Josh Smith book. Uh, I got this the second of Charles used for $5.50, uh, so not bad. This was released in response to Josh Smith having a survey at a, um, an art space in Athens, Greece. Uh, so this monograph is meant to accompany that show. Uh, it's really wild to me to think about how this uh, monograph from Athens, Greece ended up in a used bookstore in Birmingham, Alabama in the United States. I like to imagine whoever owned this and decided they didn't want it anymore and like how they came about it. I don't know, it, it's interesting to imagine those histories. Um, so Josh Smith is m mostly a painter. He does sculpture work as well. Uh, and he's got kind of a um, weird reputation in the art world. His name is impressed into the red cover here. Yeah, um, like I was saying, Josh Smith has a weird reputation in the art world. Most people tend to either totally love his work or absolutely hate it. Uh, I'm kind of in between. Uh, I think his work is kind of symptomatic of a, a larger problem with the art world, which is like this uh, artist being elevated to superstar status where uh, nothing they do is bad <laughs> because they're already famous, if that makes sense. But um, he's most known for doing these like signature paintings where he just paints his name, uh, which is kind of engaging with that art world problem of paintings only accruing value because of the painter that made them. Um, so yeah, he's kind of responding to that and also reinforcing it <laughs> and continuing the problem uh, which yeah uh, I I'm not sure how I feel about that but um, he is an interesting colorist some of these are like really obscene to me this is just hideous I hate it <laughs> um, but I think here uh, the the color choices are really interesting uh, and some of the brushwork is engaging uh, but it also feels kind of amateur at the same time. I love the palette in this one as well. I mean he's just turning this concept of authorship on its head by making the only subject matter of the painting the fact that he painted it. <laughs> Which is so interesting to me, but also I feel like making work like that is just reinforcing the initial problem. Uh, these are less interesting. It looks like they're um, block prints. Um, these uh, might have content in them, but I don't feel inclined to dissect their meaning. <laughs> like sometimes I look at paintings or other works of art and I don't want to bother trying to figure out what it means. It just doesn't feel worth the effort to do that analyzing. Um, and maybe that's a problem with me, 
but there are lots of artists and artworks that I love unpacking and investigating, but these more abstract works, um, they're visually interesting and have a nice rhythm to them, but uh, as you can tell, I'm like very ambivalent about his work, but couldn't pass up this monograph. So that's that monograph. Uh, not, I mean, it's pretty underwhelming, but uh, I think an interesting artifact to own. Um, okay, next book. So this is a monograph by Matt Connors. This is actually an award-winning monograph. Uh, it's called A Bell is a Cup. It's kind of hard to find this particular monograph. Um, this is, I'll show you what it looks like without the jacket. I bought this from Eon Bookstore in New York City. I like was looking on eBay for a copy of this. And they sent it. It didn't come with this um, plastic acetate style cover. They did that to protect the jacket. Um, so that's what the spine looks like. This book, I, I know why, like I totally understand why it won awards. Um, it's so beautifully laid out, the paper is insane, there are throughout the book these kind of punctuation marks of color where it's just a full color page like these, um, and there are also some really interesting essays within. Um, I love a Met monograph. So Matt Connors does these abstract paintings that are very much rooted in color theory, but he's also kind of responding to music, uh, which is a long-standing tradition with abstract painters to try and capture music in a painting. The way that music behaves, the rhythm of it. Um, yeah, so Matt Connors is kind of a part of that long tradition. This is one of my favorite paintings of his. This is um, an acrylic and colored pencil painting, and he's just sort of overlaid different pigments um, and allowed the, the colors to optically mix. And it, I don't know, it just uh, it really gets me, you know what I mean? This one is also beautifully colored. He's just a great colorist. Uh, that's probably what I admire most about his work, and this book, I feel like, is proof of that. I feel like a good artist monograph really challenges the format of the book and makes the monograph a work in and of itself, and this is kind of how that book functions. I mentioned, you know, his interest in color theory and also in music and bringing that into his work, but he also seems to be very interested in uh, writing and prose um, and those techniques. Most of the essays featured in here are from writers uh, talking about writing. Uh, so there's this really wild essay by Gertrude Stein uh, where she only uses the period as a punctuation mark and foregoes all other pu punctuation, and it, the, the essay takes on this wild rhythm, um, which you can kind of see in his paintings, him investigating the language of the painting and thinking of marks as punctuation that break up the image. Yeah, so I can see the correlation there. Like this passage here, I think is so brilliant. Okay, so he has a blank white page where nothing is happening. These next two pages are also blank, but they have an orange border around them. So it's almost like having a palette cleanser <laughs> before you enter into more painting documentation. 
There's another palette cleanser. I really love this one. Kind of investigating the frame as a concept. The installation of his works are always interesting. He often has paintings leaning, uh, sitting on the floor, being installed in alternative ways. I think, I mean, I could very well be wrong, and if I am, I probably will edit this out, but <laughs> I think it was Barnett Newman did the zips, the paintings that just have like single lines going up them. These remind me of that. There's also um, kind of parallels in the book of how it's framed. So let me find that orange framed. Yeah, okay. So like this is orange printed on a white page. This is a gray page nested inside of a blue page. So they have the same effect, right? Like this has a blue border with a gray inner. This has an orange border with a white inner, but this is all one object. This is two separate objects, uh, which is an interesting comparison and is kind of commenting on the real in painting. Uh, kind of, it's reminiscent of the Ce n'est pas une pipe uh, piece by Magritte. Like, this is not a pipe, it's a drawing of a pipe. Uh, these are not pages layered, but a flat image when looked at a certain way, if that makes sense. Maybe I'm just going on about nothing. Um, I haven't read all of the essays in this book. I did read that Gertrude Stein one, uh, and I loved it. But I'm trying to take my time with this monograph. I do look through it pretty often, but um, I'm reading the essays one at a time. This is what another example of him installing in alternative ways. I know a lot of people hate or don't respond to this extremely minimalist abstraction, but colors, color theory, uh, the way that Joseph Albers talks about it is that it's relational rather than being absolute. So yellow by itself is, and green by itself are much different than when you put yellow and green together. And, um, Matt Connors is kind of responding to that with this piece by literally leaning green against yellow. Like, it's f in physical relation to uh, the other color while also being in visual relation. I don't know. I think it's brilliant, so... <laughs> this is another one of those unreal moments where this looks like a purple border around a yellow page, but actually it's a yellow page nested inside of a purple border. And you really do think about these two colors differently when they're, when the yellow is in so much greater of a ratio to the purple. But then when you turn the page and see them beside one another, it's a, a wonderful effect. And also, I don't know if it's showing up on camera, but just this paper is, Beautiful texture. I'm fairly certain that these were printed uh, pages. Yeah, it looks like they were because you can see the white core at the center of the page. So yeah, this is ink on paper. It's not yellow paper or purple paper. They printed a flat of ink. So it's like an incredibly even texture, but you also get kind of the stippling that happens with ink printing. So that's uh, a really interesting material contrast. It's another leaning painting. These are printed borders.
is my bookmark. <laughs> this is the um, essay from Gertrude Stein that I was talking about. It's just really well written. I love the way that it's laid out on the page. Um, yeah. There's another installation view. another really great painting and uh, I like Matt Connors because he works primarily with acrylic which isn't something you see a lot with painters most painters hate acrylic paint and he I think really takes advantage of the fact that it's water-based and does these thin washes that they look so quick and loose the way that the gestures move across the canvas it's just really rhythmic and I can see his references to music. If you can find a copy of this monograph, I mean, I would recommend you get it. It's kind of expensive, um, but worth it, I think. is Matt Connors, A Bell is a Cup. Let's go on to the next book. Okay, next up we have this monograph on knowing and not. Uh, it's kind of a combination monograph between a writer and a visual artist. So uh, the Bernadette is the painter and De Agata is the writer. They met, yeah, <laughs> Okay, so they met, uh, they both had residencies, one at the Lannan and one at Chinati in Marfa, Texas. Uh, and if you guys aren't familiar with those programs, they're like extremely selective and exclusive. Uh, and I kind of was heartened <laughs> by the fact that I've never heard of either of these artists. Um, so like maybe, Getting a residency at Chinati is not end all be all, you know what I mean? That's my own shit that I'm, I'm talking about, not theirs. These paintings are at times bad. <laughs> but sometimes there are interesting textures, like I think this painter, what is his name? Bernadette has an interesting handle on the medium, but some of the color work is just... Uh, um, yeah, so you can see he gets these interesting effects of like splotching and like the fluidity of the brushwork is really interesting, but most of the actual paintings are just... There's like nothing going on. Like it seems entirely about materiality. And I'm more of a content artist. Sort of punctuating the, the book are these writings that Agatha wrote. I believe it's a story, I haven't read it. But um, I mostly find this book interesting because of how tight these paintings are on the page, like the borders around them it are so thin uh, and you really feel kind of 
overwhelmed by the spreads. Uh, they're just like so tactile and rich in texture. And I think that's a really interesting choice for a monograph because I feel like documenting paintings that way, up so close, uh, can kind of skew your perception of them. You need that space, that gallery wall or um, buffer to see the image in the context of something else so you can judge it a little bit better. I mean, maybe I'm making that up, but like, aren't these overwhelming? <laughs> like, they almost feel like nature photographs. Just the detail that's conveyed here. It's kind of hard to get it on camera because the pages are so shiny. But again, I'm very interested in knowing who turned this into a used bookstore in Alabama when this was produced as a result of two artists that met in Marfa, Texas. <laughs> uh, yeah. I also have no sense of scale with these paintings. Like, I don't know how large these are. These could be the size of this book, you know what I mean? Or they could be huge. The only indication that I got, I don't know if you guys saw, but with this painting, you can see right here, there's a shoe impression. So maybe that indicates, like that references the body a little bit. And can help me to picture the painting's uh, scale a little bit better. I think that's another shoe impression. Yeah, like, this for me is uh, awful. That, um, warm gray in the background with this yellow on top of it is, like, obscene. It's so bad to me. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the... On Knowing and Not by John Dagata and Jean-Baptiste Bernadette. And then the last book is this monograph by Peter Fishley and David Weiss. I don't know if it will focus on the spine there. So Fishley and Weiss have worked together for a long time and I, you know, vaguely know about their work. I know it has a lot to do with Mimesis. So like imitating objects through art and making something that maybe is indistinguishable from the real thing. This is the introduction here. Let's get into the meat of it. Sometimes I find these monographs at Second and Charles and they're just like so cheap that I can't help but buy them. This monograph seemed to be produced for a show that they had, where they had all these like ceramic sculptures. So you can see here, this is like peanuts. This is a recreation of a rocket shooting into space. And they're very crudely done. Are they ceramic or are they cement? Unfired clay. Also, kind of these studies of objects in different forms. So this is like a wooden palette in different colors and finishes. Uh, 
There are some different chairs and furniture, more pallets, shoes, bowls. They're almost kind of like taking inventory of these objects. I mean, I'm looking at this book without any context whatsoever, so I'm just kind of guessing at what the meaning is. Uh, some of the objects indicate like mechanic work, mechanical work, uh, engine, cars, tires, and then we get like cigarettes, so like maybe this is documenting uh, a workplace. There are some lighters and candles. Perhaps these are objects that exist uh, in relation to other objects, but like if for instance, if a car didn't exist, why would you need motor oil? <laughs> um, there are some pencils, some paint bottles, paint trays. This seems to be the previous objects in the context of a studio. Yeah, so it looks like these were all replicas of everyday objects from a series of hand-carved and painted polyurethane installations. These are questions. This kind of reminds me of Brian Eno's work that he made, oh, what is it called? Am I my car? Would I make a good cop? Will happiness find me? Am I a donkey? How much is 42 times 87? Who runs the city? <laughs> What does my dog think? Am I one of the chosen? <laughs> Those are interesting questions to pose. Are fashions plagues? It's uh, an installation view of the questions and they're in neon, right? They're kind of hovering over this uh, bed as if uh, the person thinking of these questions is trying to fall asleep at night. bunch of landscapes and it looks like they've installed them on these kind of slide viewing light boxes. These photographs of airports. Yeah, so that's the Peter Fishley and David Weiss book. Yeah, so that's all the books I wanted to show you guys this time. Uh, let me know if you want to see more of my book collection and hear me talk more about artists and artworks. Uh, and I will see you guys next time. Bye!